know, 2024, I've got a big prediction for 2024. You ready for this? Here's my prediction for 2024. Uh, Not just in the church world, but in our country. 2024 is going to be a crazy year. Anybody else have that same prediction? It's going to be a crazy year. It's going to be a messy year. I know you're excited about 2024 right now, but when you think of all that is to come in this year, to be honest with you, I'm like, Man, this, this year is going to be another one of those tough ones, I believe. I believe it's going to be a year where things are going to get really crazy. And I'm not afraid of that, but at the same time, I want to be prepared for that as a church. Here's what I believe. I believe that as a church, specifically our local congregation here, we need to be unified on why we exist as we enter into 2024. We need to understand why we gather together here in this circle. Uh, In 2023, we saw over 1,400 new guests come onto our campus. And with every single person, there's a different experience and a different church background and a different expectation of what churches should be. And so to start this year off, I just wanna make sure that we all are on the same page of really what to expect when it comes to the heart of Harvester, when it comes to the mission and vision of Harvester. Because if we we don't know why we exist. Here's what'll happen. The world will try to tell us why we exist. You know, that's true, right? If we don't know why we exist, we will fall for anything. And if we don't know who we follow, we will follow anyone. And I want to make sure going into this year, we understand what our mission is, what Jesus has given us as our mission as a church. But also I want to make sure that we understand going into 2024, who we follow. And can I give you just a little sneak peek at that? He's got a name. His name is Jesus. And man, he is a great king. He is a great Lord. He is a great savior. And that is the person we follow. Our mission at Harvester Christian Church is this, to lead people to find and follow, say it, Jesus. To lead people to find and follow Jesus. We're gonna come back to you time and time again. Here's who we are about. We are about Jesus. And what we try to do as a church is we want to lead people to find him because we believe there are people who do not know who he is and who have not found him yet. So one of the reasons we exist is to lead people on this journey of finding who Jesus is. And then once people have found Jesus, then we wanna show them what it looks like to follow Jesus day in and day out and to make him our king and to make him sovereign above all things. That's why we exist as a church. Now, the reality is that's why every church exists. That, that's, that's the mission statement of every church. Every church words it a little bit different, but there's an evangelistic part of the mission of a church and a discipleship part of the church. We want people to find Jesus, but then we want to disciple them to follow Jesus. Every church should be doing that. What sets Harvester Christian Church apart really is our vision for how we want to go about our mission. If we want to lead people to find and follow Jesus, like every church does, how do we do that at Harvester Christian Church? That's what I wanna be on the same page about when it comes to this year. And so what we're gonna do during Discover Harvester is it's a four week series and we're gonna go through the four parts of our vision. And here's just a quick overview of those four parts. Our, Our mission and vision starts with the world. We need to understand that we're a part of a world. And what do we do with that world? We want to secondly help the world to encounter the person of Jesus so that they can become like Jesus So that once they become like Jesus, we can unleash that hope that Jesus has put inside of us back into the world. So this is how we do it. At Harvester, our mission starts with the world. We want to encounter who? Jesus, so that we can become like Jesus, so that we can unleash the hope of Jesus back into the world. Over the next few weeks, I'm gonna explain every single one of these and what that means. But today what I wanna do is start with the top. I wanna start with the world. Because often, a lot of us believe that the mission of Jesus starts right here. That it starts on Sunday morning. It starts with the church. It starts with Christians. But when you look at Jesus and how he approached the world and how he approached his ministry, it started with the world and it didn't start with the church. And so what I wanna do is just give you three things that we are intentional about because Jesus was intentional about these three things when it comes to the world. The first thing is this, we are intentional about our view of the world. 
We are intentional about our view of the world. Now, this is important to talk about because we come in with a whole bunch of different views of the world, of what we should do in the world and what the world should be doing and what the world is good at, what the world is bad at. And so what I wanna be is intentional about how we at Harvester Christian Church view the world. And as always, I wanna take that from Jesus. And so grab your Bibles, open up to Matthew chapter nine, starting with verse 10, Matthew chapter nine, verse 10. What we see in Jesus's ministry is that often Jesus's ministry was centered in the world. It was centered around people who were not followers of Jesus. In fact, so much so that he often got in trouble from the religious leaders because of that. In Matthew chapter nine, we get to see one example of that. But what I love about this example is we get to see how the religious people view the world as opposed to how Jesus views the world. In Matthew chapter nine, verses 10 to 12, it says this. It says, many tax collectors and sinners came and were reclining with Jesus and his disciples. So we see Jesus, he, he's amongst the world, right? And when the Pharisees saw this, or the religious people saw this, they said to his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? When Jesus heard this, he said, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. Now in these three short verses, we get a perspective difference between the religious people's view of the world and Jesus's view of the world. The tax collectors, they say, we see the people that Jesus is around and here's how we would define them tax collectors and sinners. We, we define them by the, the tax collector world that was just a, a greedy world. They were thieves and robbers. They took from people. And so they're, they're sinners. That's how we view them. Why does Jesus hang around people who are sinners? And Jesus, hearing them say this, he tries to redefine how they view the world. And the way that he does that, he says, those who are well have no need of a physician but those who are sick, those are the ones who need me, essentially. Religious people said, those people are sinners. Jesus looks at them and says, they're sick. The religious people looked at the people and said, those are wicked people. And Jesus looks at them and says, actually those are wounded people. Now how we view the world matters because if we view someone as a wicked sinner, what do we do? We avoid them. That's what we do. If, if someone's wicked and they're sinners, what we will do is we will build a wall between them and us because we wanna keep them and their wickedness and their sin far from us. But if we view people like Jesus viewed them, we do something completely different. We don't build walls. At Harvester, we view the world as Jesus did. And so when we talk about the world, the, the phrase that we use is a lost and wounded world. When we consider the people outside of our walls, the people who don't know Jesus, the people who a lot of religious people will just look at them and point, those are wicked sinners. The way that we view them is we view them as lost because that's how Jesus referred to them, is that they were lost. They were people created in God's image who were lost that Jesus came to come and find. And then he also viewed them as wounded. You know, when you, you view the world like Jesus, you begin to approach the world like Jesus. Jesus viewed them as lost and wounded, and so he didn't move away from them. What did he do? He moved towards them. You ever run across the, a, a lost kid in, in the grocery store or out and about? You don't, your, your perspective isn't like, they're lost, we gotta stay away from them. No, you move towards so that you can help. When you run across someone who is wounded and in need of assistance, you don't build a wall between you and them, you move towards them. When you see the lost and wounded, your concern turns to compassion. Time and time again, it says that Jesus looks at the world and his heart breaks for them and he feels compassion for them and he moves towards them. When we are intentional about viewing the world as lost and wounded, we don't wanna hate the world, we wanna help the world. And that's my vision for Harvester, that we're not a church known in society and in the media and, and around town that that's the church that hates the world. 
I want to be a church that says, we help the world. There's this phrase in Christendom and Christianity. Um, it's been going around for some time. It's hate the sin, love the sinner. Have you heard this phrase? Well, we hate the sin and love the sinner. Um, I understand this phrase, okay? I, I, I get it theologically, but it's a cl- cliche that I think fails practically. Because unfortunately, what I've seen time and time again, even though theologically I understand it, what practically I typically see is that Christianity gets really good at this first part. We get really good at hating the sin and pointing out all the things that we hate in society. And there are wicked things in society. There are sinful things in society. And Christians can be really good at saying, let's point all these things out. But then we stumble at loving the sinner. Because what typically happens is we hate the sin, but love the sinner. But because you're sinful, we're gonna build a wall up between you and I because of your sin. And it's not because we don't like you, it's we don't like your sin, and so we gotta avoid you because of your sin. And what that avoidance feels like is, hate the sin, hate the sinner. There's a pastor in, uh, on the West Coast, his name is Glenn Packiam. I love what he says about this phrase. He says, Jesus' mission was much different. He says that Jesus didn't come to hate the sin, love the sinner. Here's what Jesus came to do. Jesus came to forgive the sin and transform the sinner. That's what Jesus came to do. Do you you see the difference there? When we say that we are a people who are about hating the sin, loving the sinner, all we are doing is we are making a statement about sin. But Jesus does something different. He comes and deals with sin. He says, I'm not just gonna show up into your world and go about city to city and say, I hate that, I hate that, I hate that, I hate that, but I love you guys. That's what I came to do. Just tell you the things that I hate and tell you that even though I hate the things you do, I love you. Have a good day. We'll see you guys later and move on. What was Jesus's mission? To do something about the sin. To go in and bring healing to people who were wounded in sin and wounded by sin, to forgive people of their sin so that he could transform the sinner so that the sin would no longer be a part of their life. What I love about Jesus is he doesn't just diagnose our problems. Like a great physician that he is, he actually deals with our problems. He deals with the wounds. And so one thing I wanna be intentional about as a church is intentional about how we view the world and how we speak of the world. Second thing I wanna be intentional about is our presence in the world, our presence in the world. I don't just wanna like view the world in a certain way. I want us to be intentional to do what Jesus did and that's to actually move into the world. There's uh, Jesus's ministry, it goes on. And in Luke chapter 10, if you wanna turn over there, Luke chapter 10, starting with verse one, Jesus actually, he's got some followers by this time. You know he's got the 12, but then something that we, we forget about often is that there was also this other group of disciples. There were 72 of them who were close disciples that he was mentoring as well. He actually recruits these 72 and puts them on his mission. In Luke chapter 10, starting with verse one, it says this. It says, after the Lord appointed 72 others, and sent them on ahead of him, two by two, into every town and place where he himself was about to go. And Jesus said to them, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. I love that it says that, like this just gives me a vision for Harvester Christian Church, by the way. The harvest is plentiful. He's looking at the world, he's pointing at the world, and he says, the harvest is plentiful. There's a lot of opportunity in this world. And so what does he do? He sends them into the world. He says, but I need more people to send. The laborers are few. And then he tells his disciples how to pray for the world. He says this, therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Go your way. Behold, I am sending you out as lambs in the midst of wolves. Did you catch Jesus's prayer here? He prays that God would send people into the world, to send them into the world. I think this is funny because often the modern church prays the opposite thing, don't we? What does the modern church pray? Father, Lord, 
It's the new year. Send more people into the church, right? God, fill our buildings to the brim. That would make us a success, successful church. And I think the modern church measures success by how many people we bring into a building. When all the while Jesus is saying, here's how I measure success, by how many people are sent out of the building. Like churches, we become really good at doing outreach programs that draw people into the building. One of the things that the modern church has done is we do outreach programs and we create these fun events and typically where are those outreach events held? In church buildings. We're like, let's do, a, let's do this kind of part, let's do a fall festival, or let's do this big blowout bash thing in the church building, and then if the world will see the thing that we're doing, they will come to us, and then we can tell them about Jesus. And Jesus is like, you're doing it backwards. Here's what I want you to pray for. I want you to pray that your outreach programs send people into the harvest. Pray that we send more and more people out into the harvest. He says, there's plenty of people who need me, but there's few people who are willing to be present in the world. One of the things that I love about Harvester Christian Church is that's our philosophy. That's our mission. You know, I've, I've had a whole lot of people who, who come to Harvester and they're like, tell me about all the outreach events that we do here. And we need to do more outreach events on campus. And I'm like, that's not really our mission and vision. Our mission and vision is not to entertain people on our property. Our vision is to send people off of our property into the world. Chris Figgins and Kevin Hamilton, they, they're part of our global and local outreach ministry. And what I love about their heart is not that we need more events here on campus, but we need to recruit more and more people to go into the harvest, to take Jesus into the harvest. And so the way that we reach our city locally is not to hold more and more events on campus, but it's to recruit more and more of you to leave our campus and to go into the school system. And we've got these great teams that partner with all the schools around us to go and minister to the homeless, to go and minister to foster families, to poor, to widows, to go to all the various countries and mission partners that we support in Mexico and Haiti and Indonesia and Ethiopia and Athens and all over the world. We are trying to be an answer to Jesus's prayer when he says, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into the harvest. So at Harvester Christian Church, we are intentional about being present in the world. Third thing we're intentional about is this. We are intentional about our message in the world as well. Now, it's one thing to be present in the world. It's another thing to begin to talk in the world. There are a lot of Christians who are present in the world speaking the wrong message from the wrong heart. And so one of the things that we wanna be intentional about is when we go out in the world, specifically into a world that we view as, these are lost people, not evil people. These are wounded people, not wicked people. How do we talk to wounded people? How do we have conversation with lost people? Are we out there yelling at them for their wounds? Are we out there pointing out every wrong thing in their life? I think sometimes that's what churches desire specifically for their pastor. And can I just make a confession to you? I'm not that kind of pastor. I know some of you wish I were, but I am not a pundit, I'm a pastor. One of the things that just kind of weighs heavily on me often is just the, the temperature of our country and every time something happens in our country or in the world, like there's this pressure I feel of like, I have to make a statement. Anybody ever feel that way? I remember as a younger person in my early 20s, that's what I wanted to do. Something happened in the world, I tweet about it. Something happens in the world, I blog about it. Something happens in the world, I stand up and make a strong statement about it so that people know where we stand. When I was younger, I was very prophetic. The older I get, the more I realize that God asked me to not be the lead prophet, but the lead pastor of Harvester Christian Church. And a pastor cares for the wounded and shepherds. And yes, there's gonna be times and probably many times where I'm gonna stand up here and I'm gonna speak out against some evil that's happening in our country. But chances are, I'm not gonna do it as fast as you want me to do it. 
Because here's what I've determined to do. To before I say anything, I'm gonna stop and listen and understand first. And I think our whole country needs more of that. Before something happens in our world, everybody wants to make some kind of bold statement and then you've got to backtrack that because you didn't quite understand everything that's happening. But then that bold statement, you realize how that falls on people who are wounded. And then all of a sudden that statement comes from this heart that you didn't understand and to this heart that you didn't understand. And now you've distanced yourself from the very people that you're called to bring to Jesus. And so I promise you this, I'm gonna speak about things and when I speak about things, it's gonna come from the word. But before I speak about things, I need to understand how it applies to the word. And so I'm gonna take time to pray. I'm gonna take time to listen. I'm gonna take time to understand. And then when we talk, I'm gonna talk pastorally because our message matters. And it matters because it mattered to Jesus. When Jesus was sending out the 72, he said, I'm gonna send you out like lambs among the wolves, but I'm gonna send you with a specific task and a specific message. In, in verse eight of Luke chapter 10, this is what Jesus tells us 72. He says, whenever you enter a town and they receive you, eat what is set before you. And then he tells them this in verse nine. He says, heal the sick and say to them, the kingdom of God has come near to you. Those are the, those are the two action points that he gives them. When you enter the town, heal the sick and say to them, the kingdom of God has come near to you. But whenever you enter a town and they do not receive you, go into its streets and say, even the dust of your town that clings to our feet, we wipe off against you. Nevertheless, know this, that the kingdom of God has come near. Now, what's the message that, that Jesus is sending them with? There's two things that he's asking them to do in this world in verse nine. Two things is first is, let them know that the kingdom of God is near and let them know that you're there to heal the sick. Now, in, ver in chapter nine, Jesus, he sends his 12 out among the city and he, he actually does it in this order. The kingdom of God is near and heal the sick. In this passage, Jesus flips it and says, what I want you to do is enter the city, heal the sick, and then let them know that the kingdom of God is near. And so Jesus, he's not really concerned with the order, but what's interesting about chapter 10 is we get the impression that he's not saying, Tell them the kingdom of God is near, and then if they believe you, then heal their sick. And only heal the people who believe that the kingdom of God is near. He actually says, go into the town, heal the sick, then tell them the kingdom of God is near. And if they take the healing, but they don't listen to your message about Jesus and this king who was close and near, move on, you can move on. You don't have to force them into belief, but do let them know before you leave. Nevertheless, even though you don't accept this message, this message is still true and Jesus is still near. Now, what I love about this message is it's a message for two kinds of people, for lost people and for wounded people. And at Harvester Christian Church, if we're gonna view the world as a lost and wounded world, what message do lost people need? They need to know that the kingdom of God is near. If there's a man who stepped into this world because he loves you and he paid the price for your sin and he's changing this world. And the kingdom of God is growing all around us and people who put their faith in this man, they are being found and he's close to you. He's near to you. But he also cares about you. And this healing that comes is because the God who is near isn't here to torture you. He's here to heal you and cleanse you. He's heal, here to heal the wounds. God is near. He cares about your spirit and he also cares about your situation. As we enter 2024, we need to know that the way that we view the world matters. Our presence in the world matters. And then our message to the world, it matters as well. Now, why does it matter? Because of this, I think you're gonna find, it, find this out this year. You will always find who you're looking for. In 2024, if you're looking for a certain group of people to be mad at in this world, 
there is going to be plenty of opportunity to find those people. Okay? If you're looking for sinners in this world in 2024, you're going to notice them all around you. If you're looking for people to make your enemy so that you can feel like a victorious person, you're going to find them all around you in 2024. If you are looking for idiots on social media, they are in abundance. You will find them in 2024. If you're looking for a fight, you'll find a fight. If you're looking to ridicule people who are confused in this world, if you're looking for people who fall short of God's glory, you will find them in abundance. But at Harvester Christian Church, we're looking for something different. And so as we start this journey together in 2024, I want you to know that what we're looking for is people in this world who need forgiveness. Those are the people we're looking for. We're looking for people in this world who need a second chance. We're going into this world looking for people who are wounded by this world by the decisions of this world, by decisions of people around them, and maybe even wounded by their own decisions. And we're trying to be a people who step into this world. We're trying to be a people who willingly step out of our comfort zones to compassionately step into the lost and wounded world. And at Harvester Christian Church, our mission doesn't start here. It doesn't start in our church buildings. Our mission starts out there in a lost and wounded world. And once we find the lost and wounded, you know what we're gonna do? We're gonna help them. We're gonna tell them that the kingdom of God is near, that we know the king. In fact, we also know their wounds because we behave the way they behave. We have some of the same wounds that they have. And to be honest with you, some of those wounds still exist. But we know a king who cares for them. And we also know a people who is on a journey of being healed from those wounds. We're gonna let them know that the kingdom of God is near. And then we're gonna introduce them to our king. Next week, we're gonna talk about what that looks like. Like I said, our mission starts with the world. But what we're gonna see next week is that when we're in the world and we're present in the world, we're purposefully there to help the world encounter Jesus. This is where the miracle begins. This is what we're gonna talk about next week. Will you pray with me? Father, um, as, we, as we jump into this, this new year, God, there's a lot ahead of us and um, I'm not exactly sure what's gonna happen this year, but here's what I do know is gonna happen is that you are gonna be present. Your mission is gonna continue and you are gonna keep calling out more laborers into your harvest. And God, my prayer is that we as a church are open and available to going. God, I pray that we are less offended and that we are more compassionate. God, I pray that you give us the boldness to speak your truth, but God, give us the grace for that truth to be received well. God, my prayer is that you create a Harvester Christian Church, a church that's on mission. We do not desire, God, to be a cruise boat where we are entertained. God, help us to be a rescue ship that goes searching for those who are lost and wounded, to bring help, to bring healing, and to introduce them to the person who can do that. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Everybody say it with me. Amen.